The sermon uh, is entitled The God of Small Things. The God of Small Things. And I'll take you back to 538 BC and the great Temple of Solomon was destroyed by the Babylonians earlier than that, 586. And uh, the people were carried off into exile. The main uh, learned part of the population, the ordinary, some ordinary folk were left in the land, and of course Nebuchadnezzar uh, resettled other people into the land of Israel, into Judah and other areas there. And these events, of course, you can imagine Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was torn down and burned with fire. And the Jews, that was a shock to the Jews. Uh, it caused the greatest crisis in the history of Israel. And it wasn't just a social, uh, political and psychological crisis as would be naturally expected, but it was a theological emergency. Theological emergency. Because remember, these were the chosen people. God had bound himself to them by covenant. He was their partner for all time, or so they thought. And with the demolition of the, the temple and the exile to Babylon, it seemed that the very existence of the covenant had been permanently undermined. It seemed that way to them. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and Daniel, it was revealed to Daniel, and I will not turn to it, Daniel 9, verses 1 and 2, it was revealed to him that. 70 years would be the period in which the Jews would be in Babylon, uh, in the capital of Mesopotamia, and the children of Israel then were permitted to straggle back into the land of Canaan, into Judah, and the areas they formerly inhabited uh, in 538 BC, under the, the Persians, kings, the Medes and Persians. But there was nothing there to raise their spirits at all, you know. The legendary days of David and Solomon, the heroes of Israel, especially David, uh, they were gone forever. Uh, there, if you were in Israel, and if you try to picture during the war, uh, I certainly wouldn't have had the opportunity to be in Germany after the Second World War, but cities there were flattened. Dresden, firebombed, people <laughs> obliterated. Um, Jerusalem, you would have seen nothing but ruined buildings when the people returned there. Temple flattened, destroyed. There, were poor agri there was poor agriculture. A depleted population was all that was left. Uh, no signs of a return to greatness. No signs. Even though the exile was over, in a sense. And in the prophet's words, the return was, and we turn to this in uh, Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah, chapter 4. And down in verse 10. God is saying here, who despises the day of small things? Because here, 50,000 Jews were allowed to return at this time. And uh, they, what they saw didn't give them any confidence. And the inhabitants of the land laughed at these Jews coming back to Jerusalem. And they were saying, they'll never build the temple. <laughs> build the temple, ha ha. Build the walls. No way, they'll never do that. And they didn't want them to do it. They were antagonistic to the Jews. And so God sees all this and he says, who despises the day of small things? Yeah, it is. It doesn't seem to be great strength here. Who despises the day of small things? And uh, the leaders weren't men of stature. The Zerubbabel was the governor. And uh, of course, 
It's hardly an entering down the ages because he was descended from Jeconiah. And God had said that no descendant of Jeconiah would ever sit on the throne of David. So he wasn't ever going to be king. And therefore his name didn't rank really among the surrounding peoples. Um, and yet Zechariah the prophet brings this word from the Lord. You know, whoever who despises the day of small things shall rejoice when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel because God was going to see that the temple was built or rebuilt. And uh, Zerubbabel was the governor uh, and in the power structure of the Middle East it didn't reckon, didn't rank at all. And the image is of Zerubbabel standing over the construction site with a plumb line in his hand. We all know builders use plumb lines to ensure that the walls are straight and so forth. And he was preparing to lay the cornerstone. The vision is of him laying the cornerstone for the new house of worship. And it seemed a feeble undertaking, a day of small things. But God's promise is the foundation on which the temple would be built. God's promise. And if we move in Zechariah 4 and in verse 6, uh, so he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What are you, O mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become level ground. And he's talking about the opposition to the rebuilding of the temple or the Jews even repopulating Judah or that area. Then he will bring out the capstone to church of God bless it, God bless it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. And Zechariah, of course, was a prophet there at that time. Yes, who are you, O great mountain? The Lord purposed that the temple would be rebuilt and uh, because God had determined it, nothing can stop it. And it was uh, finally rebuilt and uh, there was a delay of some 15 years. And then it took five years to do the building. So 20 years later, in 536, the temple was rebuilt. And then <clears throat> we'll turn to move to Nehemiah, just before the Psalms. Now, let's see. Nehemiah chapter 1. The words of Nehemiah, then verse 1, the words of Nehemiah, son of Hekeliah. In the month of Kislev, in the twentieth year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, this was a relative, a brother of Nehemiah, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. And they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And then I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night. For your servants, the people of Israel, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted wickedly. So he was confessing uh, sin here. And uh, he reminded God about what God had said, if you're unfaithful, I'll scatter you, which God did. Israel was unfaithful. And uh, he mentions their, their, God's, their God's servants. And so forth. And then he, he says further down in verse 11, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant 
and to the poor of your servant who delight in the, in the revering of your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favour in the presence of this man. He was about to go in to the king, Artaxerxes. Another name for him was Longshanks. Longshanks. He must have very long legs. Uh, but Nehemiah was cupbearer to the king, and in, uh, we read that here. I was cupbearer to the king. And of course, uh, that meant you tasted the wine in case it was poisoned. Now, it's a good job. I don't know if anybody wants a job of, of wine taster or cupbearer. <laughs> but uh, there's a high salary, apparently, and good pension. The only thing, some of them don't live to ever get the pension. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so he went into the king here in uh, chapter 2. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, Why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said, What is it you want? Now just, you can notice here how God is working by his spirit. Then I prayed to God. Now here was a man, Nehemiah, he prayed to God. He was with the king. A silent prayer from his heart. A silent prayer. I prayed to the God of heaven. He had already prayed, you see. Remember we read that? And I answered the king, If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favour in your sight, let him send me to the city in Judah, where my fathers are buried, so that I can rebuild it. Then the king with the queen said, How long will your journey... He didn't even say, Oh, I'll have to think about that. <laughs> How long will your journey take? And when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. And actually, Nehemiah was there for 12 years. So he rebuilt the walls and all the rest of it. So he, he requested letters from the king to the governors and the various areas he had to pass through so that they would provide safe conduct for him. And uh, he had a letter so that he would be provided with timber, etc., for any construction work he would be doing. And he went, went to Jerusalem. And in verse 11, I went to Jerusalem, and after there, being there three days, I went out during the night with a few men. Now, you'll notice a couple of things here and today people would think that these practices are modern. And you would notice them as, and they wouldn't have known anything about skills like this away back then. You know, 538 BC. Now I sat out during a night with a few men. I had not, not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There, was no, there were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night. I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal, well, and dung gate. He went round all the, the wall. He was surveying the damage to the wall. Uh, he examined the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, this is verse 13, uh, moving to 14, which had been destroyed. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate, the king's pool, and there was not enough room for my mount to get through, so I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing. He acquainted himself with the situation. Now, surely they wouldn't have known all these things back then to do that sort of thing. Not to let anybody know so that nobody could circumvent them or anything. Or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. And I said, you see the trouble we are in, Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned. Come, let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. 
and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king had said. And they replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this work. And of course, it names a few people who were violently opposed to any work when done in Jerusalem. When Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? I answered, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. There was a man chosen for the job. And he was a man well skilled. You'd wonder where he acquired this skill. He was a wine taster. It's like a cobbler going out and expected to build a, a Titanic or some a ship or something. So they started to build. And they built the walls of Jerusalem in 52 days. 52 days. And when, as they were doing it, of course, uh, they were threatened all the time. Um, Sanballat and, and his friends threatened to come in by night and kill them and stop the building. And they laughed. They didn't think the Jews would do it, you see. Didn't think they would build it at all. But he, Nehemiah had a very, very uh, shrewd way of operating. And again, modern businessmen would say, well, you know, they would think this was a modern thing. What he did, he, he assigned, first of all, they, started, they seemed to start generally to just repair the wall here and there. And then he saw the way they were being threatened. And he decided that he would assign parts of the wall to people who lived there at that part of the wall. In other words, he gave ownership of the work that was being done to those people. And they put their heart into it. And they built the wall. And at times they had to wear swords. Some of them stood with swords and spears in case they were attacked. And the others built. He, it says here, uh, above the horse gate, etc., the priests made repairs, each in front of his own house. So they had an interest in seeing that that wall was built. Uh, next to them, Zadok, son of Emmer, made repairs opposite his house. This is verse 28, etc., 29. And next to him, Shemir, the son of Shechaniah, the guard of the east gate, made repairs. And so on. And um, next to them, Meshulam, son of Berechiah, made repairs opposite his living quarters. And this is the way Nehemiah operated. And they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem in 52 days. And that, what did God say? Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. And his spirit moved the people. There were many problems um, for Nehemiah to deal with. And we won't go into them. Uh, the walls were built, the temple had been built, and God had said, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So the second temple was built, and at length the 500 years odd later, the incarnate Son of God came to teach in the temple's precincts. And of course, Herod was beautifying it to curry favor with the Jews at the time. Um, what Christ brought in his teaching was strange to those who heard it. The temple elite were unnerved by it. They said to Jesus, what sign do you show us? John 2, book of John chapter 2. The Gospel of John. And uh, 18 to 22. Yes, he, here in this account in John, he has driven out uh, the sheep and cattle, etc., and the money changers out of the temple. 
Get out of here, he says, this is 16. Uh, How dare you turn my father's house into a market? Verse 17, his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews, verse 18, the Jews demanded of him, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Of course the Jews, uh, you know, it's taken 46 years. In other words, Herod's refurbishment and beautifying of the temple was, had taken 46 years. It has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days? But of course he was talking about the temple of his body. The temple of his body. And when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he'd said that. They remembered that. And we're coming near that season now when we will remember also. Uh, They remembered the word he had spoken. So Jesus, what the temple was really was a sign pointing to what was to come. Jesus, God himself coming in the flesh. Jesus replaces the temple. That's why we read in, uh, in the book of Revelation uh, that there's no temple in the city in Revelation 21. Revelation 21. I think it's verse 21. Yes. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is its Lamb. So, no, there was no temple. This is talking about the new Jerusalem in the new heaven and the new earth. And uh, John uh, saw that, he was, it was shown to him in vision that the temple actually was God himself. And it, it's wonderful to see uh, different passages in the Bible interpreting and confirming one another. And that's something, you know, we should pray about, that we would increase in our love of Scripture of reading and perusing scripture. Sometimes we can lose that love. We can become careless about regularly reading scripture so that we know it. It's in our, in our heart. Yes, because when you think about it, remember Psalm 119 and one of the, it's, it's written in sections. One of the sections it says, Thy word is a lamp onto my feet and a light to my path. That we have a hymn. I don't think we sing it very much. We sang it, we used to sing it in Belfast. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And it talks about when I go astray, etc., etc. Can't remember it all word for word. But uh, yes, it, it's a light for a path, it, it's bread for our journey. It's living water for our parched souls, and we need that water. And, you know, when you look around in our country, there are huge cathedrals built to the glory of God, and beautiful stained glass windows telling the scripture and story because when they were built, people couldn't read or write. And it was to give them an idea about what the Bible was talking about. I'm not saying it was always done accurately or truly, but that was the, the idea behind it. And all those great cathedrals will one day crumble. They'll not be there anymore. Just like the temple where God's presence was, was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. The second destruction after the Babylon Yeah, those things. But God's word will stand forever. It'll always be there. And we are promised an eternal future in the city of God where the risen Christ will pour out his 
inexhaustible love. The love that we can fathom. You know, you say to yourself, do I know how to love? Do I understand what loving is? And I'm learning. I'm learning. God is love. And he's, he's teaching me. He's teaching you. We can't say we are love like God is love. We're learning. Because we're brought up. We're fallible human beings. Our parents were fallible. And they did the best they could. They did the best they could. I remember uh, one thing my mother always did was uh, books that I had as a child that seemed to be all related to the Bible. I had a, a, a book and there was a, a picture, an illustration with each story, Bible story. And I remember one clearly in my mind. Abraham about to sacrifice Isaac on the altar. And there was this illustration and the story, the scripture underneath. And I remember, we used to read through them, the sisters and the south. But, uh, yeah, our parents did the best they could. And would we have done as well in their place? I doubt it. And today, of course, we're encumbered with so many distractions. So many things which claim to be love and aren't. A lot of false loves around which leave people high and dry, or whatever. Yeah, God is teaching us to love. And God isn't a God who takes whatever shape we want him to, depending on the spirituality of the moment. You hear people talking about wanting spirituality. <laughs> what are they talking about? It's usually New Age stuff they're talking about or a mixture of Hinduism and other things, where your reincarnation. A lot of people, um, a lot of people believe that they may come back as a worm, or depending on how they live now, or some other creature, or a butterfly, or that's not what God has in mind for human beings, not at all. See, we're talking about the Alpha and the Omega. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning, the one who, who is and who was and who is to come. And this is the God who's going to create the new heaven and the new earth. And here's the promise in uh, verse 1 of Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city. The new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Everything new. And moving down to verse 6, he said, It is done, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this. I will be his God and he will be my son. Wonderful. That's the promise of the God who's able to raise the dead. He's able to raise the dead. We could ask ourselves, who will enter the city of God? What does it say? It says, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Yeah, it says these people will be excluded. Everybody I know is on that list, including you and me. We're on that list. But as Paul says, 
You know, we are washed. We are redeemed by the blood of Christ. We are redeemed. Harry Potter's going to be in trouble. Sorcerers. <laughs> Don't know if you've read Harry Potter. What about lying? What about idolatry? At some point or other, that includes every one of us. At some point. But, as I say, our sins have been forgiven. Because of Jesus Christ, selflessly giving himself as a sacrifice. There is a, a scripture in 1 Peter 2. Just back a wee bit here. 1 Peter 2. And in verse 2, Peter says, Like newborn babes crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in, in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good, and we have tasted that the Lord is good, brethren. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices accept, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, chosen and precious, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. So we are actually being built into a spiritual house, brethren. To offer sacrifices to God. And just like the rebuilding of the temple at Jerusalem, just like it was opposed, our growing into that temple is opposed as well by Satan, by this world, by all the, the accepted ways of living in this world, which we see things being turned upside down. Um, yes, we, Satan doesn't want us to be that, in that spiritual house. He doesn't want us to be part of that spiritual house. He doesn't want us to be in the New Jerusalem. So, brethren, we have to ask God for His Holy Spirit to strengthen us so that we follow what the way to live God says is the way to live, not the way the world says. And the world is twisting and distorting things. Children growing up, you know, they're fed a lot of garble, garbage, or rubbish. Garbled, distorted, supposed to be facts, but not the truth as God gives it. Children aren't given that. We may think, you know, God is the God of small things. What could be smaller than a human being? The way we're even conceived in the womb. So fragile we could be destroyed very easily. Then a tiny baby helpless growing up into an adult. And how can we influence people to live the right way? I remember our daughter asked us to pray for a matter. She said, would you pray about that? And I said, yeah. We prayed about it and it worked out. And she asked again about another thing. And I said to her, did you pray? And she did. So even though you feel that you're not very good at uh, putting across the Christian way of life, and you're by your example. It's God who does it through the Holy Spirit working in you. And sometimes it's brought to your to your mind to your uh, sometimes you're made to see that He is operating and He is working because He brings people people you think are not interested anymore. Our daughter, her generation grew up in the church. 
And when they came to a certain age, they stopped attending. I remember she, uh, she was home from university one time and she said, uh, Dad, she always went to church, we always went to church together. I have a headache, it's all right if I don't go to church today. I said, sure. Yeah. But that was only the beginning. <laughs> But you know, it doesn't matter about those things because God has his way of working. And what we regard as the day of small things, it's not by might nor by, you know, strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And you may have influenced people, influenced people you don't even know about. You don't even know about. And that is excellent. Because, Brian, we need we need to be built up and we need to be working with God in that building up as he does that. Paul told us we are temples of the Holy Spirit and as a, a church, a group together, it, we are a temple and all the small congregations throughout Britain and the world. And just think today in many areas of the earth people are meeting together, maybe in the afternoon or whatever. And if it isn't today, maybe on a Sunday, they're meeting. Glorifying God. Being taught, being fed, by being encouraged. Because we need to stay in there. We need, it's so easy just to say, I guess really making no difference, you know. It is making a difference, brethren. It is making a difference. And we need to make sure it makes more of a difference. And that's by cooperating with God, what God is doing. Uh, there's an old, uh, uh, some of the African American churches uh, have hymns, and, uh, and one of them, I, I think it says, uh, God is capable, you see. But the, the, the way the song goes is, God, yeah, the, the verses go, and then it ends, God is able. And God is able. Our God is able. He is all the power. Remember Jesus after his resurrection said, all power and authority in heaven and earth. That is some power, that's all the authority there is. It's the authority and power that made the, cre the, the whole universe has been given unto me. So God is able and Christ is able. Um, in Jude 24, which is just, let's see. Uh, verse 24. It's part of the, the closing benediction here in, in Jude and it says to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you, present you before his glorious presence without fault. You see, God is going to present us Christ is going to present us without fault and with great joy to the, on, to the only God our Saviour be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. So we are going to be presented without fault, perfected. We're not perfect now, but we will be perfected. God will do that. See, God is able to call into existence things that don't exist. We don't see in ourselves, but we're in Christ. And when we, in the resurrection, we'll see then what we are, because we'll see him, and we'll be like him. We'll be like him. So, brethren, make sure we're together, that we don't give up meeting together that we develop and grow in our love for the reading of the scriptures and thinking about what they're saying. And you read a scripture once or twice and you, you think, ah, yeah, I understand. And you read it again and you see more in it than, there, than you saw the first time. So ask God to strengthen us. Help us to remember that it's by his spirit things happen. And they will happen. And that new Jerusalem will be there for us 